What's up, all? As you know, the next book I want to review for you is Enemies, A History of the FBI by Tim Weiner. I originally heard about this book because I read Legacy of Ashes, The History of the CIA by the same author, and even though I didn't enjoy reading it, it had a lot of information about a subject that's hard to find good information about. So I figured I would go ahead and pick up you know, the history of the FBI and see if it was as informative. And I feel like personally, I knew more about the CIA just because of like myth and legend than I did about the FBI. So I found this book that while it was dry and boring and tough to read, it was very informative, but it could again be condensed down into like a hundred or so pages. And I'm gonna kind of go into that a little bit. Um, again, the author, like, it reads like a gossip column, and it jumps around, and so you'll finish one chapter, and it's talking about, like, a Puerto Rican group of terrorists, and the next chapter starts with, like, some president, like, ten years later, it seems, or an individual that you don't even know who it is, and it's like he's trying to create a gossipy feeling to it, or, like, a gotcha moment with each chapter, instead of just conveying information. And so I, I found that to make it a lot, like, fluffier than it needed to be, and a lot harder to follow than it needed to be, and it ultimately made the book like a lot less readable. So I don't recommend this book. I would suggest like finding maybe a Wikipedia article, like I said about the uh, Legacy of Ashes one. Uh, I mean, it's a good book if you've got the time, but I had to force myself to read this. I did not enjoy reading this. The book does follow the history of the CIA in kind of chronological order, which makes sense. Um, and you can think of the history of the FBI in three sections in my opinion, that's like the Hoover years, or like the predecessor to the FBI. Uh, the fallout after Hoover was removed from power, like the 10-year struggle to figure out how the FBI would work after Hoover uh, was no longer running it. And then like kind of modern steady state operations, where it seems to have tried to follow the Constitution for once. And what I mean by that is, I'm going to go through this, you can see under Hoover, it seems like the FBI was never constitutional, was always violating the rights of its citizens, and it seems like every FBI agent under Hoover, as soon as they took their oath of office, immediately violated that oath of office. So it's interesting to think that this agency that, or the FBI, I'm not sure if I'll refer to it as an agency sometimes, um, is completely unconstitutional and unlawful. But in the modern world, it may actually serve a decent purpose. And I'll kind of go into that as we go through because the, on one hand, maybe it's me making a mistake. On the other hand, it does seem like the landscape of terrorism has changed in the last hundred years. I want to read this on page three, which is actually the first page of the book, uh, about the origins of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover himself. Uh, so it says, quote, He worked Sundays and nights, as I did, O'Brien recounted. I promoted him several times, simply on merits. Hoover rose quickly to the top of the division's Alien Enemy Bureau, which was responsible for identifying and imprisoning politically suspect foreigners living in the United States. At the age of 23, Hoover oversaw 6,200 Germans who were interned in camps and 450,000 more who were under government surveillance. At 24, he was placed in charge of the newly created Radical Division of the Justice Department. End quote. So let's unpack that. First of all, one of the things that I hate about like the corporate world sometimes is like the people, the, the no-lifers, are the ones who are seen as working hard just because they put in the hours. And you heard there, he got promoted on merit, but a lot of it was hours. And then when you find out, it seems like Hoover was probably a gay dude. Uh, now there's anything wrong with that. Um, and he was spying on people. And so he was just kind of getting his jollies with his job. And it's kind of creepy, to be perfectly honest. And then when you factor in that a lot of the FBI, when you look into it, was blackmail and illegal spying and just kind of being a creep, it does seem like the origins of the FBI is just creepily, a gay dude getting creepy on uh, a lot of people that he was violating their rights. And it just seems like he was able to sell that uh, and get f black funding for that creepiness, and it grew into the FBI. Um, and it's interesting, like, when you, when you go into it, it looks like oftentimes FBI agents were kind of like guys who could not serve in the military because of, you know, we didn't allow gays in the military. So maybe uh, individuals who want to serve in the military ended up joining the early FBI as, like, you know, gays finding a way to contribute. Um, and you think, like, Deep Throat, we'll go into that later, like, Deep Throat, that's like the gayest nickname ever. Um, so... I think as you go through this and you read it, it does seem like there's an element of like enabling LGBT participation in government uh, counterterrorism efforts through um, the FBI. Uh, so I just think that's kind of the origin of it. 
Um, yeah. And the other interesting thing is it started off as just being like an anti-communist thing. Like, okay, we're looking into prevent the spread of communism in the United States. Um, which is kind of interesting because if you saw my review of Milton Friedman's, one of Milton Friedman's book, he talked about how the every single policy of the early Communist Party has been implemented in the United States already. So technically, if that was the origin of the FBI was to stop the spread of communism, the FBI has lost. An interesting meme I've seen from time to time, it says like the government has a monopoly on the use of force and violence in your society. And I think that's pretty appropriate. And you kind of think of the FBI as being that cloak and dagger domestic force that an executive uh, agent or the executive branch of the government can utilize from time to time. It's kind of like their cloak and dagger, you know, again, brute squad. And again, going back to the origin, you think of some of the early presidents before the FBI, they needed some muscle to settle down like the Wild West or like just like the New World, right? It was an ungoverned shit show in the ancient world. Um, and I'm really eloquent there. But on page nine, I want to kind of talk about one of those early precursors to the FBI, where it's like how many of these gang type forces, probably each state had its own, uh, were then maybe consolidated or fell apart. And then the FBI is the last man standing in these days that's consolidated all of those other like jackboot thugs. So uh, I think that's a Thor quote. So on page nine, quote, four 19th century presidents had turned to the nation's most trust, most powerful private police force, the Pinkerton National Detective Agency, as an instrument of law enforcement, a source of secret intelligence, and a tool for political combat. I have always been averse to appointing and paying detectives, Attorney General Benjamin Brewster wrote in 1884, but he did it nonetheless. The agency's founder, Alan Pinkerton, had run espionage missions during the Civil War and helped create the Secret Service for President Abraham Lincoln. Its detective serves railroad and steel barons by spying, breaking strikes, and cracking skulls to defeat labor organizers. They paid secret informants whose identities were protected with code names. They did not shrink from breaking the law to uphold the law or using violence in the name of order. In 1892, Congress banned the government from hiring the firm after a confrontation at the Carnegie Steel Company in Homestead, Pennsylvania, that left three Pinkerton men and five workers dead. The White House was now bereft of skills, cunning, and force of private eyes. End quote. So you see there, it's like some, the Pinkerton gang, which is pretty famous, uh, so it's Pinkerton police force, had obviously then been, no, was no longer allowed to operate. So the president, at that time, choosing to still use unconstitutional tactics, enabled the FBI to be created. And again, it expanded because when people are willing to break the law, that gives them an enablement. All right. And so you can kind of think of drug dealers, right? They have an, a market because they're willing to break the law against the government. Well, in a lot of ways, some of these DOJ guys that seem to see themselves as above the law, they get there because they're willing to break the law. Right. They rise to the top because they use tactics that law abiding agents were not willing to utilize. And maybe those ones lost contracts. And that's why the FBI, again, rose to the top, because as you see, as we go through this book, almost everything during the Hoover years seems to be unconstitutionally and black market funded or black uh, with black money. Again, this book is hard to follow, and it seems like he's talking like a, as a gossipy, like in a hair salon or something. So I'm going to read, a, I'm going to jump around on two pages and kind of try and put it together in a more consolidated fashion about the origin of the FBI. So starting on the bottom of page 10 and going into 11, quote, President Roosevelt directed Bonaparte to create an investigative service within the Department of Justice subject to no other department or bureau, which would report to no one except the Attorney General. The President's order resulted in the formation of the Bureau of Investigation. By law, Bonaparte had to ask House and Senate to create the new, bu the new Bureau. The Department of Justice has no executive force and, more particularly, no permanent de detective force under its immediate control, Bonaparte wrote to Congress. It was thus assuredly not fully equipped for its work. He formally sought the money and authority to create a small, carefully selected, and experienced force. On May 27, 1908, the House emphatically said no. It feared the president intended to create an American secret police. The fear was well-founded. Presidents had used private detectives as political spies in the past. And then jumping down, Congress banned the Justice Department from spending a penny on Bonaparte's proposal. The Attorney General evaded the order. The maneuver might have broken the letter of the law, but it was true to the spirit of the president. Theodore Roosevelt was ready to kick the Constitution in the backyard whenever it gets in the way, as Mark Twain observed. The beginnings of the FBI rose from that bold defiance. End quote. So again, it's the president is here to serve the law, not the other way around. 
and it's exactly what like they banned the secret like the Pinkertons which were being used as secret police so then instead of like adhering to that uh, I guess it was Teddy Roosevelt maybe at the time then started the FBI so that he could get again blackmail and information to coerce people against their will to do things they didn't want to do and that's kind of the origin of that just coercion and espionage uh, so again it just Congress said no and a tyrant uh, circumvented their will through the manipulation of tax dollars and bad accounting practices. So as the FBI was formed, it was kind of like figuring out how it could enact the authority that it was never given by Congress. And so I want to read a couple of quotes. First on page 13, quote, about Hoover, quote, he oversaw hundreds of agents and informants working for the Bureau of Investigation. He could call for the arrest of almost anyone he chose. He began organizing a nationwide campaign against the enemies of the state. He was still only 24 years old, end quote. And so you kind of think about that. That's, A, pretty young to be in charge of so much, uh, especially something that's illegal. Um, but the network of informants, the book I go, goes into a really good job of explaining why wiretaps and stuff like that are extra dangerous. And it's because of the like the Kevin Bacon rule applied to espionage, where it's like, okay, if you, if you listen to everyone's one person in every conversation they have, well, if that person talks to 100 people, now you've just violated the constitu constitutional rights of all those 100 people as well. Uh, and where does it stop? Um, and so that's just why it's, again, it's because some president wants to satisfy their, like, what-if scenario games in their head, they're violating the constitutional rights of a ton of people. And I've always not understood, I've never understood, like, the fear of communist thought, like, yeah, let people talk about it. It's really stupid. Um, and unfortunately, because I think when the FBI cracks down on communism in these early periods, it forced them to go underground, uh, making it so it took root in our universities, which is now we have an, a bigger problem with it today. Like, I always find if, you, if you're transparent, things are usually better. Uh, but again, going into the next, like, I just want to ramble there. So the origin was rooting out communists in America, where apparently being communist is still illegal in America. You would have to check all the laws in the United States now because there's just so much bloat in the legal system. But um, apparently it's illegal to be communist as of the writing of this book. Um, but, and on page 14, quote, Rose Pastor Stokes, a Russian immigrant married to a millionaire American socialist, was sentenced to 10 years in prison under the Espionage Act for saying that, quote, no government which is for the profiteers can also be for the people, end quote. Uh, still in quote, like, yeah. Eugene V. Debs, the leader of the American Socialist Party, was indicted for speaking out against her conviction. He had won close to one million votes running against President Wilson, but he would conduct his next campaign from prison. In quote. So a guy who got a million votes was then imprisoned? That seems like something that I, I'd never heard about in the histories of America. Like, we're not supposed to do that. That seems like what's happening to Trump right now. Um... That's crazy. And again, it's because of a difference in policy, uh, which, as, you, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, all the ideas of the socialists in the early 1900s have been implemented in the United States. So the United States is actually fairly socialist these days, and that's why it's economically collapsing. And again, a final thought on these arrests that I just mentioned. Uh, if that's a violation of freedom of speech, like how can you be arrested for making a state a nonviolent statement? Like that's not even an incitement of violence. That's not anything angry. That's just sharing ideas. That is one of the goals of freedom of speech is to allow ideas to be shared. Um, and I would refute it. Like instead of arresting a person, right? No government which is for the profiteers can also be for the people. Uh, that's wrong, right? Because capitalism, the way it works, is as somebody is pursuing their dreams, they need to buy things from all these other people in order to achieve their dreams, right? So like when I make my apps, I hire artists to and designers to help me with the peripherals that I can't do. Uh, it also then supports uh, the app store because every download I get goes to them and taxation. So like that's just off the top of my head. So like as profiteers, which I'm a profiteer that is unsuccessful, um, start being profitable, they hire more people. And so again, I just disagree with the fundamental premise of communism. Uh, and the assumption of communists is that the leader is God, right? And not just like a regular God, but like the total like Christian God that's like omniscient, benevolent, uncorruptible, and like is good. Um, and it's just unlikely. So it's communism is the policy of the weak. Now, I want to make two points about Hoover before I read this next quote on page 55 about the expansion of the FBI's power unconstitutionally. 
And it, throughout the book, the author, Tim Wiener, references like the origins of the FBI being like a nebulous statement by a president being like, get it done. Like, what does that mean? He should, and so I can't remember which president he said that gave like, like the nebulous statement where, again, it's like bad leadership. The president should have said, like, try to accomplish this without violating the Constitution, something like that. Um, but probably even more, much better guidance than that once you're actually in the seat and you know what you're trying to accomplish. And maybe you should say, like, respect the freedoms of the people the most. That's the most important thing. Something like that. But unfortunately, these presidents were looking to protect their power as opposed to protect the power of the citizen, which is a mistake. Um, and so I think that bad leadership was why that the FBI was able to do these unconstitutional tactics. And again, uh, the other thing, people usually flourish when they're enabled in certain ways. And so Hoover, again, I think he's a creepy dude who got his jollies by spying on people and being a gossip. Um, he flourished in that role. And so it just makes total sense from a, like a free market, like natural movement of things to where they need to be. Yeah, like so Hoover was given the ability to violate the Constitution and do whatever he wanted uh, and satisfy all his creepy urges. And he had presidential authority to do it uh, and funding as well. And so I just feel like you can kind of see how that would snowball. And there's, one of my favorite lines in this book uh, was about like that there's nothing you have to fear more than the overzealotry of like righteous men. Uh, and it's again, so Hoover probably thought himself to be a good man. And so any of his violations of the Constitution were warranted. And I, one of my favorite things I'll touch on later in the book where they're like, like somebody was slamming their fist down in rage, judging Martin Luther King for uh, having an extramarital affair. And it's like, how are you judging somebody for having an extramarital affair while you're violating the Constitution that you're sworn to uphold and protect? Like, ah, seems hypocritical. But on that note, again, to start that rambling, on page 55 about the expansion of uh, the FBI's surveillance powers against American citizens, specifically even against members of Congress who they should be really protecting as well. On page 55, quote, By the time Congress reconvened in March 1923, Daughtry and Burns were conducting political espionage against senators whom the Attorney General saw as threats to America. Their bureau was breaking into their offices and homes, intercepting their mail, and tapping their telephones, just as it had done to members of the Communist Party. The only rationale was the political movement in the Senate toward American di diplomatic recognition of, the Soviet, of Soviet Russia. Sorry, let me reread it. The only rationale was the political movement in the Senate toward American diplomatic recognition of Soviet Russia, end quote. So, again, it started off with, like, we're going to spy on communists, which is just another political party. Um, and then it expanded to anybody who's even working with those people. But it's like, if you're a congressperson, you're supposed to work with people that you don't agree with. Like, that's part of being a politician. It makes me think back to the one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, where, like, the Russian politician who was sent to the United Kingdom to work with the United Kingdom, when he got back, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for knowing people in the United Kingdom. Uh, <laughs> so, again, it's just respect freedom and privacy uh, of the citizen, and A, you won't have the cost of the FBI, and then you also won't have the incurred cost of the loss of freedom as a result of these like kind of creepy dudes getting paid to creep. I wanted to read page 76 because I thought it was really awesome on like why wiretapping and government surveillance of its citizenry is bad, but it comes down to legally it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment which protects the citizen against unlawful searches and seizures by the government, right? Like you have a right to your property and the government does not have a right to enter it. Uh, it's like they're like vampires, right? You have to invite them in or they have to have a warrant. And it's interesting to think that they're trying to circumvent warrants, which usually like they've chosen the district attorney. So it's like asking your best buddy, hey, buddy, give me a warrant for this. So it's just really a common sense double check. And when I get into it, they'll talk about this later on, this black court that was created. It said they've never rejected a single request. So really not getting a warrant is just laziness. Um, and But I, I think I've re referenced this quote before. So again, on page 76, it's, quote, The greatest dangers to liberty lie in the insidious encroachments by men of zeal, well-meaning, but without understanding, end quote. So again, it's like the... Spanish Inquisition, right? The hardcore zealots torturing people who disagreed with them. They were probably well-intentioned men of zeal. Um, also, uh, I mentioned this again previously, again on 76, quote, tapping of one man's telephone line involves the tapping of the telephone of every other person whom he may call or whom may call him. Hoover's men knew that well, end quote. So again, it's if you tap into a phone conversation, you're not just violating the, the rights of the person that you meant to violate <laughs> you're violating the rights of every person that you also listen into 
Uh, and so it becomes like an exponential crime against uh, the privacy and, you know, it's an exponential, <clears throat> an exponential tyranny. I believe there's a French philosopher, Montesquieu, who talked about the spirit of the law. And so when you hear these lawmakers deliberately violating the spirit of the law so that they can get away with their tyranny, it's really upsetting. And so it explains how Hoover started doing wiretaps in spite of it being unconstitutional. He said on page 77, quote, he interpreted disclosure in a lawyerly way. Wiretapping was not illegal if the information was not used as evidence in court. Therefore, if it was secret, it was legal. The FBI thenceforth used wiretaps whenever Hoover authorized it. Wiretapping, bugging, and break-ins became the holy trinity for FBI intelligence operations from the 1930s onward. Hoover believed that they were essential tools for protecting the United States against spies and saboteurs. President Roosevelt knew such methods were standard practice in the game of nations. End quote. Again, it's just sabotaging people that he disagrees with and at the whims of the president, which back then was in the Cold War era of anti-communist. And then again, to think of this expansion where it started off and it was Hoover and four agents. Um, now suddenly, in it, says, it looks like October 14th of 1938, Hoover had 587 agents in the FBI. Again, where's this funding coming from? How are they getting the resources to do this? Uh, all of it's through kind of laundering money through government channels. Um, and it's never been stood up at this point, but it's just expanding and growing. And it's just... A police surveillance state and it's literally exactly that secret police that we needed to avoid to hammer that point home is actually a really good quote now on page 96 quote hoover established the special intelligence service on july 1st 1940 with funds from a secret account created by the president congress knew nothing about it no law authorized it very little was written about it outside a secret history compiled after world war ii and kept classified for more than 60 years the, plane, the plan was impressive on paper, but it ran headlong into reality. This was not the FBI's kind of war, end quote. So that's leading up to World War II. And so they created this secret you know, intelligence agency that clearly failed to anticipate Pearl Harbor. So there was actually a lot of need for counter-espionage in the United States during that time. Uh, because in the lead up to World War II and during the Cold War, right, so in the lead up to World War II, this... Nazi Germany was infiltrating the United States to sabotage uh, infrastructure as well as set up the stage for a future invasion. Um, and then during the Cold War, um, I mean, obviously Nazi KGB agents were all over the United States trying to sow the sods of discord and create uh, a communist movement in the United States. And it, it's interesting because it goes into this agent, George Dash, who apparently I believe was a Nazi saboteur sent to the United States just to blow shit up. And he I chose not to do it, and he turned in all the other saboteurs, and he got 30 years in prison. So it's like, yeah, he came here to cause harm, but he didn't do any harm. And the FBI, like, basically destroyed that entire network, which is good. Like, they should have arrested everyone in the network. I don't know about Dash, seeing how he was the informant. Um, but it just, again, they use that as their victory. Uh, but it seems like none of the guys, when you read the story, like, none of the saboteurs were actually going to cause any sabotage. It sounds like uh, because they were all they'd all just quit as soon as they got here, um, and they all. So that one's a tough one. Like and it, like for that to be the greatest victory of the FBI, being like one guy who said he was paid and hadn't caused any harm, saying that these other guys were also going to cause harm but hadn't caused any harm yet. It's again, it's like that minority report. So I like this quote on page 122 about just that bad nature of arresting prematurely. Uh, like if you violate people's rights just to make sure that they don't do something bad, you're going to create a lot of negativity in your society. Um, so on page 122, quote, in the 19 months since Pearl Harbor, the FBI had arrested 16,062 suspected foreign subversives. But roughly two thirds of them, about 10,000 people, were released after the civilian panels deemed they were not a clear and present danger to the United States. As it happened a generation before, the FBI had swept up thousands of people who were innocent. They, they, the steady dismissal of the cases made the Attorney General inquire into the depth and accuracy of the FBI's intelligence files. End quote. So, I mean, that's 10,000 people wrongfully in prison, which is the ultimate goal of the United States justice system. It's supposed to be to prevent the unlawful imprisonment. I mean, other than like imprisoning criminals, it's supposed to also be preventing the unlawful imprisonment of innocent people. Uh, and so it just seems like everything the FBI does is a direct violation of that. I really like this random quote on page 214 for a lot of reasons. So, quote, 
The president turned to Hoover for a full report on the case. Mitchell had been found to have homosexual tendencies. Hoover told the president and Martin was noticeably unstable. But the Pentagon had granted them top secret security clearances nonetheless. The president found this outrageous. He connected communism and homosexuality, as did Hoover. They both believed without question that homosexuals were especially susceptible to foreign intelligence services. End quote. So I want to kind of touch on that a little bit because it just it seems bigoted and wrong in so many ways. Um, so first, let me just talk about like homosexuality and communism. Like, okay, logically they do seem a little bit related because most gays are Democrats and most Democrats are communists. So it would seem to be that way. But I think this is again a case where it's like most gays are Democrats not because they're communists. Most gays are Democrats because Republicans throughout all time have pretty much been bigots. Uh, like I myself was a lot less accepting when I was younger. Um, and now the times have changed. So like logically all gays would vote Democrat and therefore they would seem to be communist. So that's what like causation correlation. I think that's the impetus for that statistical uh, reaction. It's as the statistical analysis there. The other one is gays would be more susceptible to foreign service influence. I would say again, in the ancient world, that would be like likely true, not because of gayness, but because if a, a group is oppressed, they're going to be more likely and more vulnerable and more able to be exploited. And a foreign service agent looks for people that are exploitable. So for that reason, that correlation again would exist. But again, if you remove the exploitation, uh, it removes the reason for that vulnerability. So again, it's causation correlation. They, the FBI and their um, hazing of gays or the bigotry towards gays causes the actual problem that they then have to root out. The book briefly touches on Martin Luther King, and it doesn't talk at all about Malcolm X, so I thought that was a huge omission. Uh, but on page 235, the part on King I thought was interesting, quote, Hoover kept bombarding the Kennedys with memoranda accusing King of leading a role in the communist conspiracy against America. He commissioned FBI reports on the deep history of the Communist Party's connections for the, with the civil rights movement. What he wanted was a document so convincing that it would destroy Martin Luther King. The 19 million Negroes in the United States today constitute the largest and most important racial target of the Communist Party USA, read an August 23, 1963 report from FBI intelligence and chief Bill Sullivan to the director. Since 1919, communist leaders have devised countless tactics and programs designed to penetrate and control the Negro population. End quote. Um, and it also says, I have in my notes here, that on King they had eight wiretaps and 16 bugs, as well as the book it says that the full range of surveillance on King, Martin Luther King, will be declassified in 2027, assuming that it is not extended by the FBI for you know reasons they don't want bad things to get out. Um, so again, it's just a shame because they're looking at Martin Luther King as an enemy and targeting him as a communist agent in the United States as opposed to a guy looking to create freedom for his people. Um, and it's crazy also that same Bill Sullivan uh, goes on later to become the director of the FBI. So this guy who in the 60s was leading the charge against all these, quote, dangerous Negroes then became a leader of the Department of Justice in, I believe, the 70s 80s, or 80s, somewhere in there. So uh, when you hear people talk about criminal justice reform or African Americans talk about criminal justice reform, wow, to, to hear somebody that's there, uh, like that's their statement in the 60s, like that probably shouldn't be in power. Um, yeah. And I'll probably get into it a little bit later, but I think one of them talked about like, they had an FBI agent try to go and assist actually the African Americans during the civil rights movement, and like all of them refused. Uh, but the thing, the, the sh stat that shocked me is it said that every single member of the police force was a member of the KKK, which is very saddening. It's interesting to see how Hoover and the FBI got away with some of this stuff, in addition to just, you know, not caring about the law that they were sworn to uphold. Um, on page 278, Hoover, it says, quote, Hoover emphasized that the FBI had conducted without a search warrant black bag jobs, break-ins, and bugging for every president since FDR, and it included surreptitious entries and intercepts of voice and non-voice communication, uh, end quote. So again, that's him bragging about violating the Constitution if the president asks for it. So serving the president instead of the Constitution, and again, the president's supposed to be serving the Constitution, uh, not the other way around. Um, and then it mentions how Hoover gets away with it, and it says... 
on page 279, quote, you know, about a month or so before I ever go up to testify before the appropriations committee, I discontinue all taps so that when they ask me the question as to whether or not I am tapping anybody, I can say no, end quote. Super easy, lawyerly. And routinely through the book, they point out things like that where like a guy, he had like stuff he needed, he didn't want to have anymore, like incriminating evidence. So he just gave it all to someone. And that way he could say that when he was, when he was questioned, he'd be like, I gave it all to this person. Or I turned it all into this location, right? And it's like, if they do that, then they can wipe their hands of it. Um, and what's interesting is I, you heard in the news recently that the F, that Congress approved warrantless wiretapping. I think it was like a week ago. So A, Congress needs to look into that. But B, I wonder if there will be any like grandfathering in or like approving of violations of the last hundred years. Be like, hey, you know, we know that we were we violated the law for a hundred years, but now we're allowed to do that because we just passed this new law. And it's a shame that tyranny and corruption uh, seem to take the shape in the legal system these days sometimes. So everything kind of came to a head, it seems, during Nixon. And I guess that was just after Hoover had died or been removed. Um, but I want to just read a couple of thoughts that I have, some notes here. Uh, it says, Nixon really upped wiretapping because he's a criminal. Um, and it said what he would do is specifically is they would up the wiretapping of reporters as a way to find leakers, right? Because who do leakers go to usually? Reporters. So if they bug the reporter, they'll get the leakers preemptively. Um, but again, when you think of the compounding nature of tyranny, that means every person that reporter talked to had their, their rights violated. Um, and I th personally, I think that those reporters and the companies that were running those reporters have a right to file a grievance against the United States or a class action lawsuit for every single one of those violations. Um, but it talked about also like there's a group called the Weathermen that they were looking into. And it said they had 38 bombings. None of them were solved. So what did the FBI do? Um, and it also mentioned like the difficult nature of the FBI is like when there's two million marchers on a protest, how do you determine the difference between a guy with a sign or a guy with a Molotov cocktail? And it's the same issue that police have to deal with every single day when someone approaches them. And that's why police have a tough gig. Um, and I think they, like if you look at January 6th, a couple of people got significant prison time, like the instigators, the guys who were in there like breaking down barricades. But most of the people got warnings, and that's probably the right way to do it. Because um, like if the, I would say like the thousandth person through that door, I wasn't there. But like the thousandth person through that door probably was like just wandering around, looking around like at that point. Um, but the first person through that door knew exactly what they were doing. And so more thoughts on Nixon. It did say that like when the Pentagon Papers were released, which was kind of a scathing insider review of the Vietnam War and the corruption of the Vietnam War. That was when Nixon was like, fuck this Hoover guy and really kind of moved on from him. And then the Watergate uh, fiasco again is Nixon's trying to secure his presidency so he's using the FBI as a bully force against his political opponents and again when you think about it the history of it was anti-communism so in a lot of ways that is a bully force against your political opponents because the communist party like back then it wasn't a two party system so I don't think so that was literally just subverting uh, an, your opponents before elections um it turns out the the FBI leaker during the Watergate thing was uh, the guy named Deep Throat was the leader of the FBI, Mark Felt, who I believe he was chosen after uh, it said he was chosen after uh, Hoover stepped down. But then because he wasn't getting everything that he wanted, he started using you know leaking as a way to accomplish his goals, and he, so he got replaced. And what's good is again I think there was like the, the Hoover years the turmoil following Hoover, which is what we just mentioned. And then there's the post Hoover years where it's like actual good men started taking over the FBI. And it seems like over the next like 20 years, the FBI was at least not just, uh, it's probably still not a constitutional organization, let's be honest. And on that note of like the new leadership of the FBI actually trying to respect the constitution, it's shocking that this would be necessary. But on page 328, it talks about like how to rein in that corrupt history. And it says, Quote, on December 5th, 1973, he sent a written warning to everyone in the bureaus, 8,767 agents. So again, think about that ex ex uh, expansion of power. It was like four dudes at first. Now suddenly it's almost 9,000. He ordered them to refrain from investigative activity that could abridge in any way the rights guaranteed citizens by the Constitution. 
He began to dismantle the architecture of national security that Hoover had created. By the time he was done, the FBI had eliminated 94% of its domestic intelligence investigations, erased more than 9,000 open cases from its books, transferred the roles and functions of national security cases to the Criminal Investigative Division, and reassigned at least 645 agents from chasing radicals to tracking common criminals. End quote. That seems like what it should do. Like, instead of chasing down, like, oh, this guy might say something that's communist, like, how about go after bombers? Uh, go after international terrorists. So again, there's like 8,000 agents that are just doing stuff that have never been constitutionally funded or approved. And they just have like back channel money that Hoover's found a way to manipulate. Um, and it's interesting. So as this fallout post Hoover's having, there's this guy Webster. I don't have to see his first name in here. Um, as the new director of the FBI. And it's, he's trying to legitimize it. He's trying to get like actual funding for his people and secure their place and get like real guidance from uh, the government as to what the FBI should do. And so it says on page 344, quote, Webster was compelled, as he put it, to pretend we have a charter. What the FBI got instead was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the product of years of struggle among Congress, the FBI, and the CIA. It had created a special court of judges selected by the Chief Justice of the United States who met in a special soundproof chamber on the top floor of the Justice Department. The court's purpose was to approve wiretapping and electronic surveillance requests by American intelligence officers and to do it under law. For 60 years, from the start of Hoover's era, the FBI had made its own laws on taps and bugs. The court was not an obstacle to the Bureau. It approved more than 17,000 requests without once saying no over the next two decades. But the target had to be an agent of foreign power. The FBI's ability to carry out secret intelligence operations was now governed by rules of law. End quote. So, stepping back one... Again, it mentions there that the FBI was just doing whatever they wanted, violating everyone's rights because they could. So that's bad. Um, and then the other one is you see that it's just laziness. So it said 17,000 requests without once saying no. So it's not like they didn't do it. Be, like They just were lazy. Um, and if you saw recently the bridge that got run into by the cargo truck or cargo ship in Maryland, right? And it was like, the FBI actually got a warrant to investigate this. And it was like, well, you guys did your job for once. So as the book goes into the modern world, it's, you know, there's not much left, right? I've gone through close to almost 400 pages now. And it's just, again, been a big gossip column about like Hoover being a gossipy guy. And so I feel like Tim Wiener, the author, to be honest, he probably just seems like a gay gossip dude. Uh, because it seems like once you get to the substantive stuff, or if you want to do a hit piece on the FBI, he completely skipped over it. So talking about like modern terrorism stuff, he goes into Pan Am Flight 103, where nearly 200 Americans were killed. And it seems like he actually says, uh, Tim Wiener says, like the FBI did good research there and tracked down both the killer, as well as Qadda founding, finding out that Gaddafi had been the fund funding it. And Gaddafi was the Libyan leader who has been since taken out. Um, but the fact that he gives only one paragraph of information on Waco, Texas, and again, only one paragraph on Ruby Ridge, which should get its own chapter each. Uh, just shows to me that this author, he is a selective author who looked into what he thought was interesting, which is like the gay drama gossip of the FBI and not the substantive counterterrorism operations that the FBI has conducted. And that's one of the reasons why I don't recommend this book. In the modern global war on terror, the lead up to it, the FBI largely failed. Um, it was interesting because this book talked about the Monica Lewinsky scandal a little bit, gave more talk about Monica Lewinsky than it did Ruby Ridge or Waco, Texas. Um, but it's interesting because it does mention the fact that if the FBI, instead of searching out like Monica Lewinsky stuff, so like damaging the reputation with Clinton so that Clinton no longer trusted the FBI because they were looking into his personal life, what if instead of looking into Monica Lewinsky and personal conduct of the president, they had been tracking down Osama bin Laden? maybe uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks could have been prevented and how much of the world would be different today if the FBI had actually done its job instead of looking into a cigar aficionado's fellatio uh, practices. Um, but you know, that's neither here nor there. And on that note of some of the attacks that happened in the lead up to 9-11, uh, it goes into the USS Cole and how the FBI like, did some international research into that. I'll go into that, but I want to talk about the Nairobi embassy bombings, which killed a ton of people in Kenya. Um, and it says the reason why it's going into like Osama bin Laden was directing these guys to attack and destroy the, anything American. Um, and it's, it says on page 402, quote, 
There were several reasons why the embassy in Nairobi was picked. The Al Awali told Guardian, told the guard, told Godin. First, there was a large American presence presence at the U.S. embassy in Nairobi. The ambassador of the U.S. embassy was female, and if a bomb resulted in her being killed, it would further the publicity for the bombing. There was also a number of Christian missionaries at the embassy, and lastly, it was an easy target. So you see, what do they want to do? They want to kill Americans. They want to kill Christians, and especially women who are free thinkers and don't, you know, just do whatever they're told and wear their hijab and, you know, yeah, they want to kill that. Uh, so it's just interesting, again, if the FBI, instead of looking into Monica Lewinsky and stupid bullshit sex scandals in the United States, have been actually looking into evildoers, maybe a lot of people could still be alive, and that includes uh, preventing the entirety of the global war on terror. So again, on the note of bad leadership, it said that one of the pilots in the 9-11 hijackings, like the actual pilots, not just the muscle, was under surveillance because while he was doing his training in the month or two leading up to the 9-11 hijacking, he was getting pilot training in the United States and didn't care about takeoffs or landing, was like, I just want to be able to, you know, ram a plane into things. And it got elevated to the FBI and they didn't look into it. Uh, so again, they were looking into Monica Lewinsky and stupid bullshit like that instead of doing their fucking job. Um, and it was also interesting, it said that the, there was a new director of the FBI. I can't really read all, like, it's just, the, the book is poorly presented. Um, but it mentions how the new FBI director, it says, on page 218, quote, the new FBI director's first week at the FBI was a blur of briefings on everything from the wreckage left by Robert Hansen to the procedures for evacuating Washington in the event of a nuclear attack. On the morning of September 11th, Mueller was being brought up to date on the coal investigation. Like almost everyone else in America, he saw the disasters on television. Al-Qaeda had turned airplanes into guided missiles. End quote. So, I mean, they're dealing with internal drama instead of protecting Americans. And that's why terrorism has flourished for those periods of time. So, after 9-11, on page 419, it says, quote, The FBI arrested more than 1,200 people within eight weeks of the attacks. Most were foreigners and Muslims. None, so far as could be determined, was a member of Al-Qaeda. Some were beaten and abused during their continued detention in harsh conditions of confinement, as the Justice Department's Inspector General later reported. End quote. So, again, it's like, to make up for their mistake of failing to prevent it, they then violate the rights of probably good people, uh, and that, again, creates even more problem because then those people are going to be less likely to trust America in the future or, or FBI leadership. Um, yeah. Also, it said that this started the age with the uh, enhanced uh, surveillance state, uh, the Patriot Act, and it mentioned how that started like FBI and NSA collaboration, where previously the NSA and FBI hadn't collaborated where the FBI is illegal to spy on Americans. But then the NSA started giving, the NSA doing external spying, started giving FBI some records for them to look into. So it kind of makes the FBI then complicit on external spying, which is what the NSA was supposed to be doing. Uh, so it then that every single bit time it probably consumed that feed from the FBI, it was probably a violation of the Constitution. I want to talk about Abu Ghraib and some of the enhanced interrogation stuff that went on during the early years of GWAT. And, you know, I was just a communications and IT guys. So like I'm obviously against any enhanced interrogation. Uh, studies have shown that torture never reveals anything useful. Um, and so it's just evil. And it's a shame that the United States participated in enhanced interrogation and torture practices during the global war on terror. And I want to read kind of the foundation of that on page 425, quote, on August 1st, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel granted the CIA's request to begin waterboarding Abu Zubayad. The technique, tantamount to torture, was designed to elicit confessions through the threat of imminent death by drowning. That same day, John Yu, now deputy to Attorney General Ashcroft, advised the White House that the laws against torture did not apply to American interrogators. The President, Vice President, the Secretary of Defense, and the Director of the Central Intelligence approved. End quote. So through this, it did say the FBI was kind of the good guy in interrogations. And like, if you kind of think good cop, bad cop, it was almost like the FBI was the good cop, the CIA was the bad cop. Um, so the FBI kind of looked good, at least as far as this book goes. But from an American perspective, I always say that Abu Ghraib and any enhanced interrogation is just a disgrace to America. You know, waterboarding, it's kind of like they say it's like that gray area where it's not really torture. But if it's not really torture, that means it's torture and you shouldn't do it. Um, America, we're better than that. Okay, uh, wrapping it up, they go into, because it doesn't, the book doesn't go into like the last 10 years. Uh, I guess it's an older book. 
and that information is probably still not public. But it talks about Saddam Hussein and the WMDs. I've talked about it many times when I've done my book reviews, but the focus on WMDs was the biggest disgrace to my generation of warfighters. Um, but on page 431, they talk about exactly that. They're talking about an interrogator who's interrogating Saddam Hussein before he's put to death. And it says, quote, six days into the debriefing, Piro questioned Saddam intensely and repeatedly about the elusive Iraqi chemical and biological arsenal that was President Bush, Bush's justification for the American invasion. Where were the weapons of mass destruction, he asked. Did they exist at all? They did not, Saddam, Saddam said. It had been a long-running bluff, a deception intended to keep the Iranians, the Israelis, and the Americans at bay. We destroyed them. We told you, he told Piro on, on February 13th, 2004. By God, if I had such weapons, I would have used them in the fight against the United States. He was telling the truth. End quote. Again, it wasn't, I don't think it was that we thought he had WMDs, that we thought that he was imminently going to have that capability and it was preventing it. And my understanding of the total intelligence picture of the WMD program that the Iraqis had is they didn't have that capability, but they were building up the ability to develop them immediately as soon as the United States stopped saying no. So it was like they were just anything that they were allowed to build, they were so, uh, procuring logistically. And anything they weren't allowed to build, they were like setting up the ability to procure it as soon as the United Nations stopped intervening and being like, hey, stop trying to kill everybody. Um, and that's kind of the real full story there, in case you're curious. What's strange to me is throughout this, I keep hearing that the FBI was behind in technology. So like they're good at certain types of technology, but they're really bad at other types. Um, and I really like this quote on page 445 about the data challenges, like the big data challenges in terrorism, as well as uh, the issues in government contracting. Um, so quote, the FBI had more than 700 million terrorism-related records in its files. The list of suspected terrorists it oversaw held more than 1.1 million names. Finding real threats in the deluge of secret intelligence remained a nightmarish task. The Bureau's third attempt to create a computer network for its agents was floundering, costing more and taking far longer than anyone had feared. It remained in a work in progress for years to come. Only a third of the internets of the FBI's agents and analysts were connected to the internet. End quote. So... As somebody who's watched like government contract companies take hundreds of millions of dollars from the government and not deliver software, it really upsets me because I can make that ticketing system for the government very easily. So FBI, call me, hire me, I'll make it for you. It'll be better than anything and cheaper than anything on the market. Again, I've repeatedly said I do not recommend this book. I did not like it. It skipped the few things that I knew about, again, like Ruby Ridge and uh, Waco, Texas, it basically skipped over. Um, it didn't really do much about the Unabomber either, which I'm pretty sure was one of the FBI, like they did a big research there. So like I just, this book, it seemed much more just like a gay gossip column again than actual substance on the FBI, in my opinion. Um, and the thing again, to, to drive that point home, it talks about that the focus on terror, this, towards the end of the book, he mentions the 08 financial crisis, like a just a whiny piece of shit this author is. Um, and he says that the focus on terrorism probably caused the 08 financial crisis because they weren't looking into white collar crimes. And that's just fucking stupid. It demonstrates the guy doesn't understand anything about the 08 financial crisis and he was just kind of like spewing hyperbole like the newsman that he is. Because if you look into the 08 financial crisis, it was largely caused by bad government regulations and intervention in the banking market by the US government. And then the banks had to pay that price. There was some bad actors, but that would not cause the overarching fall and the, co the collapse of 08. And saying that it could have is a gross disservice to your readers. And so it just shows that, again, Tim Wiener is a sensationalist gossip columnist as opposed to a substantial, a substantive author. So I want to end this with a quote from Obama where he's giving a speech of the 100th anniversary of the FBI. And it says, quote, Back in 1908, there were just 34 special agents reporting to Theodore Roosevelt's attorney general. Today, there are over 30,000 men and women who work for the FBI, the president began. So much has changed in the last 100 years, he said, turning, to the, turning on the charm. Thank God for change. The crowd went wild. So he should have said, wow, that's amazing expansion of government power that's unconstitutional, instead of saying that that's good change. I don't know. That's just me. Well, that is it for this video, guys. Again, it is Enemies, A History of the FBI by Tim Wiener. And it was a brutal read. I had to force myself to read this page by page. Each page was a churn. It was work. It was effort. I did not enjoy it. And I found that the author, again, he writes in a way that is more like sensational, like whoopity-doo, as opposed to trying to convey information. 
Um, and again, I think his focus is more on the drama as opposed to the actual substance of the FBI. I thought he neglected very many issues that I wanted to learn more about, and I was overall disappointed in the substance of this book. Um, I probably won't read any more of Tim Wiener's work. 